the story of writing, astronomy, and law. The story of civilization itself begins in one place. Not Egypt, not Greece, not Rome, but Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is an exceedingly fertile plain situated between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. For five millennia, this small strip of land situated in what is today Iraq, Kuwait, and Syria fostered innovations that would change the world forever. Inhabited for nearly 12,000 years, Mesopotamia's stable climate, rich soil, and steady supply of fresh water made it ideal for agriculture to develop and thrive. About 6,000 years ago, seemingly overnight, some of these agricultural settlements blossomed into some of the world's first cities. In the period between 4,000 and 3,100 BC, Mesopotamia was dotted with a constellation of competing city-states. At one point, they were unified under the Akkadian Empire and then broke apart, forming the empires of Assyria and Babylon. Despite near-constant warfare, innovation and development thrived in ancient Mesopotamia. They built on a monumental scale, from palaces to ziggurats, mammoth temples served as ritual locations to commune with the gods. They also developed advanced mathematics, including a base 60 system that created a 60-second minute, a 60-minute hour, and a 360-degree circular angle. The Babylonians used their sophisticated system of mathematics to map and study the sky. They divided one Earth year into 12 periods. Each was named after the most prominent constellations in the heavens, a tradition later adopted by the Greeks to create the zodiac. They also divided the week into seven days, naming each after their seven gods embodied by the seven observable planets in the sky. But perhaps the most impactful innovation to come out of Mesopotamia is literacy. What began as simple pictures scrawled onto wet clay to keep track of goods and wealth developed into a sophisticated writing system by the year 3200 BC. This writing system would come to be called cuneiform in modern times and proved so flexible that, over the span of 3,000 years, it would be adapted for over a dozen different major languages and countless uses, including recording the law of the Babylonian king Hammurabi, which formed the basis of a standardized justice system. But Mesopotamia's success became its undoing. Babylon, in particular, proved too rich a state to resist outside envy. In 539 BC, the Persian king Cyrus conquered Babylon and sealed his control over the entirety of Mesopotamia. For centuries, this area became a territory of foreign empires. Eventually, Mesopotamia would fade, like its kings, into the mist of history, and its cities would sink beneath the sands of Iraq. But its ideas would prevail in literacy, law, math, astronomy, and the gift of civilization itself. All right, that was a little intro into, of course, ancient Mesopotamia, which, of course, this week we'll be talking about um, in my uh, lecture for probably today and also on Wednesday. So anyway, I want to welcome you all back to uh, my History 1113 class. Uh, obviously, we got kind of messed up last week uh, because of the you know, situation with the hurricane or hurricanes. So I hope everybody's safe out there. Um, so I guess we're. I guess it's still week two. I guess since we didn't really get to do anything Monday through Thursday um, overall. So anyway, uh, I don't know if anybody wants to um, come into uh, Streamyard, but here's the link, of course, to Streamyard if you want to come in. Uh, there's nobody in Streamyard right now. If anybody wants to join me in the um, you know broadcast booth, but. Um, Anyway, it looks like we got a bunch of people um, on the screen today, like Colby's here, Celeste, Kayla, 
Emily, Martha. So I hope you're having a good day uh, overall to, uh, this morning. Uh, of course, you, know, you see I do have a new announcement up, of course, about um, a Canvas quiz on prehistory, which uh, that, of course, will be due next Monday, September 7th. So make sure you complete that. Uh, of course, you can see I have all the links down there are the previous lectures that we did um, on prehistory. Also have the PowerPoint slides that I used uh, in week one. So, you know, try to look over that again uh, and answer, of course, uh, the prehistory quiz. Um, I think it has, uh, I want to say, 12 questions on it. Uh, of course, there's a time limit on it. I think I, this one I gave you 30 minutes and you have two attempts on it uh, to complete that assignment. So try to get that done uh, as soon as possible. Uh, I will be sending out reminders, you know, during the week uh, when you, of course, are trying to work on it and other stuff. So uh, that's pretty much, um, you know, about that assignment right now. Uh, other announcements, too. Uh, if anybody has not turned in the contract policy page, email that to me. Uh, I think there's some that probably haven't done it yet uh, at that point. Hey, Savannah. And... Um, what else too? Um, also, uh, anybody interested still in the uh, that veterans oral history project? Let me know. I've had almost ten people sign up for it, so that's pretty good at this point. So, anybody else interested in it? Let me know. Just email me uh, about it. Uh, book reports too. If anybody knows what their book report title is going to be, uh, go ahead and you know email me about that uh, as well. So that's I think the main announcements I pretty much got. Uh, right now, overall. So anyway, uh, of course, today we're going to, of course, continue, uh, of course, talking about a new subject today, uh, which is ancient Mesopotamia. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, bring up, uh, of course, a new slide here uh, to show you uh, real quick. Um, let me open it up here. But, uh, of course, we'll be talking about um, Mesopotamia, which, you know, it's one of the first civilizations that develops overall. Uh, you saw that little short video uh, that you just looked at. Um, it's like three or four minutes long. I did post it uh, also on my YouTube channel if you want to go back and look at it. But you can see that a lot of things were developed in Mesopotamia a long time ago. In fact, I think they seem to think that just about everything that was developed later was first developed in Mesopotamia. And then it spread elsewhere, you know, throughout the world as a whole. And uh, so we're going to talk about uh, some of the early civilizations that were there, uh, which the main one we'll talk about today, of course, is the Sumerians, which, you know, is one of the oldest civilizations that really first developed that probably goes back five to 6,000 years ago uh, overall. So, yeah, there's some new stuff in the course in the slide and, uh, of course, Mesopotamia that you can you can look at. Um, there's different, uh, of course, translations of Mesopotamia, but the common translation, of course, of what Mesopotamia means is it means the land between the rivers. And uh, they're talking about, which we've already kind of mentioned this before, I know in week one when we were talking about prehistory, but we had talked about how... Um, the two main rivers that are in, you know, Mesopotamia or where Iraq is today is the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. So you can see the Tigris on the right and the Euphrates on the, on the left here. And um, of course the area of Mesopotamia is much larger. Uh, they claim that Mesopotamia is not just Iraq. It's, you know, part of Syria, which is up here, um, Southeastern Turkey. And then I guess some even claim like, where Kuwait is at the top of the Persian Gulf. Uh, so that's about the, the mostly the region of it. So it's kind of situated between Iran, which is over here. And then you've got like Jordan, the country of Jordan, which I guess is over here. Uh, although they do think that Mesopotamia sometimes may be included like over here, like where the Dead Sea is and all that. But mostly where that red lines are, you're looking at, in that picture is about where Mesopotamia was and where Iraq is mostly today. 
Now, um, oh, the origins of it, like who came up with the term Mesopotamia? Uh, there was a writer named Arian. I don't know if you heard of Arian, but Arian was a Greek writer that wrote about Alexander the Great. Uh, he wrote a book, which was called the, um, if you want me to write it down for you, I can, but it was called the Anabasis of Alexander. I'll put it on the screen for you. And uh, it was, a, a, I forget, the book I think was written around, I want to say second century, um, uh, almost 2,000 years ago. And um, Arian was uh, was talking about how Alexander had conquered like Mesopotamia, like as part of the Persian Empire. And he mentions that area. And he, I think he used the term Mesopotamia to separate the rest of like that region from, I guess, where Iran was. Uh, and all that. And so that's that's where the term originated from. And for a long time, the term Mesopotamia was used for years. I want to say up until like the 1800s, just recently. Uh, and then right around the 19th, 20th century, the, the name that became more popular later was the name Iraq. And that's the, you know, the current name they often called Mesopotamia instead. So uh, you'll notice some other stuff in that um, slide there, um, like fertile crescent is a popular term, too, to describe Mesopotamia as well. Uh, that's a popular term that's only been around about 100, 110 years. Uh, in the 1910s, there was a, um, it was, I think he was an archaeologist. Oops, let me go back up there, put that back up. But there was an archaeologist uh, by the name of um, James Henry Breasted. And um, stop sharing. Uh, I'll put his name up. James Henry Breasted. And um, he invented uh, the actual name. I'll put him on there. And um, hey, Jake. Um, but anyway, um, I think there's Jake in there. But um, it's an archaeologist at the University of uh, Chicago, I believe, came up with the term in the 1910s. He wrote a book about it. And he used the term fertile crescent to describe the fertile valleys of, um, of like where Iraq is. Uh, but he also didn't just include Iraq. Like if you go to this map here, I can show you. Uh, he even went down into uh, what is uh, where Israel is in Jordan. And he included like the Jordan River Valley, uh, Euphrates River over here, the Tigris River that's over here. Um, and then I think they do often use the Nile River, like in Egypt, is also kind of included in the Fertile Crescent. So most of these civilizations you hear about later. Sumerian, Akkadian, Babylonian, Assyrian, Chaldean. Uh, you got your um, Israelites over here, Venetians over here, Egyptians, you know, down here at Egypt as well. So there's, you know, all kinds of civilizations which are, you know, pretty much there in those areas. So that's the guy that came up with the term Fertile Crescent and it became popular later as a whole. Of course, another term that they use, which you see down here, is that a lot of people use the term um, cradle of civilization uh, to describe that same region of Mesopotamia. And you, they, I think they mentioned that in the video, how that's where you know the first civilization started, the first technologies came about uh, at that point, writing was invented, you know, and, and so on. Uh, uh, so that's that's why they use that term to describe Mesopotamia, <clears throat> cradle of civilization. And that's a modern term, too, that I think was probably developed sometime in the early modern times. They start using that term. <clears throat> so anyway, um, it's like Kiara's in here. Um, now, um, what else about Mesopotamia uh, that I've got um, in that slide? Oh, yeah, there's other terms, too, you'll see, like um, uh, like there's a lot of biblical connections to 
uh, Mesopotamia. Of course, one of the most famous is the subject of the Garden of Eden. Now, you've probably heard that story. And uh, the Garden of Eden is a topic which has been around not just in the Bible, uh, but in pretty much in um, it's mentioned by the Sumerians and other peoples uh, throughout ancient Mesopotamia. And uh, I think the Sumerians called it Dilmun, uh, D-I-L-M-U-N. And uh, it was believed to be some kind of paradise that was around where the Persian Gulf region is. And so that's where you know, that term probably maybe originated in, in the Israelites in the Bible kind of mentioned it too in the book of Genesis as well. So that's one of the most famous ones, I guess, they talk about. Uh, of course, the flood story. Everybody has heard about that, the flood story, the story of Noah, Noah's Ark uh, in Genesis. That's another you know, famous story that's around <clears throat> also as well. And uh, there are comparable stories to that that are mentioned, like by the Sumerians and others, like the Epic of Gilgamesh as a parallel story. Uh, to like the story of Noah and the flood. Um, what else, too? Um, there's also, oh, yeah, the Tower of Babel. We'll get to that later. But the Tower of Babel is another subject. Uh, Genesis 11, I believe it is. And the Tower of Babel uh, is a story that's mentioned by the Israelites. Uh, but there's a lot of these type of structures being built uh, throughout Mesopotamia, like the Hanging Gardens of Babylon in Timononki, which might be the same thing uh, as well. There's the great ziggurat of Ur. Uh, so all these types of um, more like step pyramids probably are being built uh, throughout Mesopotamia. And um, they're kind of connected to that same story. Oh, also, yeah, um, I could throw in uh, the story of Abraham. Uh, that's another story which is um, usually linked to the region and um, <clears throat> Abraham was from Ur, which is like in southeastern Iraq, where the Sumerians are. And so they think that's kind of a story that's connected to the same, you know, historical period as well. Now, on that slide, it says like, you know, Mesopotamia is a crossroads. Yeah, if you go back to that map I was showing you, that one, and I guess this one too, either one. Um, you can see how um, in that region you've got Turkey up here, but you've got you know Europe to the northwest, you've got Asia over here, you got Africa and Egypt over here. So that whole area is kind of like a crossroads uh, between three continents. And so a lot of people converged on that one area. Um, it was a very fertile valley, you know, for farming. Um, <clears throat> also, a lot of trade routes running in and out between Asia, Africa, and so on. And so uh, that whole area is fought over a lot, you know, constant wars being fought in Mesopotamia uh, between different powers. Uh, and uh, there was different um, traditional groups that controlled Mesopotamia originally. You can break them down really into two types of groups. You've got those that are what we call Semitic peoples. Most of them dominate Mesopotamia or Iraq until about the 6th century BC. So they're pretty much around there a long time. Uh, Semitic peoples can be all kinds of people. So I think it, traditionally in Mesopotamia, the main ones were like the Akkadians, the Babylonians, uh, and the Assyrians. Those are the most famous ones that were considered Semitic in origin. Uh, Semitic peoples originated mostly from like southwestern Asia. That would be, if you go back to that map I was showing you, it would be like from the Arabian Peninsula all the way up to like where Syria is. So from Syria down to Saudi Arabia, that's pretty much the whole area uh, where Semitic people came from. And so Syria, Jordan, Israel, Lebanon, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, et cetera, would be like the bulk areas of where they were. Uh, most of them uh, are based on not on race, but on language. Uh, most of your Semitic people you know, you know, speak Semitic languages that are written 
uh, from left to right, like Arabic or Hebrew or Aramaic. And uh, so those are the typical type of language type peoples that were there. Also, your Israelites or Jews are considered, you know, people that were Semitic. Arabs down here, uh, the Phoenicians, Phoenicians, of course, uh, that are uh, like where Lebanon was or is today, um, is basically another group uh, that's usually considered also um, Semitic as well. Uh, and then the other group uh, is the um, Indo-Aryan peoples um, or Indo-European peoples. Uh, these are peoples that originate either in Europe or Asia. Um, I think, although I think they seem to think they originate somewhere in Eurasia, like where Russia is. And um, a lot of them migrated all over the place, like into Europe, in the parts of Asia, uh, and so on. And the ones that we'll talk about the most later, I guess, at least with Mesopotamia, that are, that are famous later. You've got like the, that map I showed you earlier, which was right here. You've got the Hittites, which I'll talk about later, which are up in Turkey, where ancient Anatolia is, just down here. In Iran, you've got the Persians, basically. And um, although I think they think the I Iranian Persians are more related to Indo-Aryan type peoples. And I think the theory about the Hittites is that they were more related to Indo-European peoples that maybe came from Eastern Europe. So they came kind of around in two different directions um, to get to, you know, to settle in those areas right there. They're kind of in and around the area. They kind of influence it. Uh, like the Hittites were influenced by Mesopotamia. Then Iran later conquered Mesopotamia and made it part of their empire, which we'll get to later. Oh, I didn't mention about Iraq. Forgot about that. Uh, but Iraq is, uh, of course, the new name for what they call Mesopotamia now. I'll get to it later. Uh, but the name Iraq originated from the story of the Epic of Gilgamesh uh, in the famous um, Sumerian city that was called uh, Iraq, which is pronounced the same way, but it's spelled differently, U-R-U-K. Uh, and that was considered the first big famous city of the Sumerian culture, which is the first real civilization that develops in Mesopotamia. It's mostly I'm going to talk about today is Sumerians. So let's go ahead and move on uh, to talk about next. Uh, now, the first, like, I don't know, 1,500 years or so, 1,500 to 2,000 years, is often referred to as, like, the um, early Sumerian culture, or some people will call it early, early Mesopotamia or Mesopotamian culture. It's mostly uh, the culture in Mesopotamia that was influenced by mostly like two or three peoples, uh, predominantly started by the Sumerians, who are the oldest, they think. And they also think that these other two peoples that were there, which were the Akkadians and Babylonians, which were Semitic in origin. They're not sure the Sumerians, what their origin is, though. And um, they do think later that the Sumerian culture emerged with the Akkadian. And sometimes you'll hear that term Akkadian Sumerian being used to describe Mesopotamia. But uh, yeah, Sumerians, of course, are considered, they think, one of the first major civilizations in the world uh, that first starts in Mesopotamia. Uh, how do they date Mesopotamia? There's a debate about how old it is. I don't know. Some people think it's 10 to 12,000 years ago. Uh, but the Sumerians themselves are like probably five to 6,000 years old. Because uh, they do think that the Sumerians as a people entered Mesopotamia sometime about three to 4,000 B.C. Uh, millennium. And they would settle uh, in an area that was referred to as being called Sumer, which you see right here, Sumer, and um, which is like considered one of the first civilizations. And Sumer is located like in what would be uh, today – Southern Iraq or southeastern Iraq uh, is about where it is in this area. And throughout that area, the Sumerians uh, settled and created these uh, agricultural type states or cities uh, that were independent of each other. They weren't all together as like one state. So I, I think the term they usually use is city state, I think is often the term. And they were believed to have been ruled by 
separate powerful type kings. And most of their states were based off of like I said, agriculture, growing like cereal type crops, like barley and wheat uh, and so on. Uh, the term Sumer is supposedly not an, a Sumerian name, uh, but it's like a some kind of Akkadian name that the Akkadians called them uh, because um, there's a saying, I uh, believe, uh, with the Akkadians that they called them Sumerian, which meant the black-headed people or black-headed peoples. And so they think that that's the origin of where the term originated from, like Sumer. Um of course, the Bible has different names, too. Like the Bible will sometimes call it Sumer or Mesopotamia. We'll call it Shinar. You may have heard of that name being used, Shinar, S-H-I-N-A-R. And um, But Sumer is the name that, that the Akkadians called it. Uh, you can see uh, they, they built certain key cities that were famous that you can see. In this picture, Ur, of course, is famous. Aridu, um, Iraq, do you see right here? Uh, all those are famous cities uh, which are well known. Um, of course, I'll kind of talk about each one. Uh, the one they say is the oldest is Eridu, which is right here. Uh, they think that one might date back to three to 4,000 BC. So it's one of the oldest ones. They think originally, I think most of it's a ruins now. Uh, it's in southern Iraq, close to ba Basra, is where it's at. Uh, the other city, which is uh, Ur, which is right here, that one's close to uh, Nazaria, which is in southern Iraq, too. And um, that one is famous because I told you about, you know, Abraham may have originated from, because the Bible mentions about the city-state of Ur. Uh, and, um, and then Iraq, which is right here. U-R-U-K. So now it's pronounced Uruk. I think it's another way they say it too. But Iraq is usually the common name, the way they say it. But Iraq is the most famous one. It probably was the largest um, Sumerian city, maybe 80,000 possibly people living there. And uh, that one's where the name Iraq originated from. And it's believed to be the legendary city where King Gilgamesh came from, you know, in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, and all that. So, so those are the kind of cities they built. Most of their cities were built out of mud brick, um, which was a common form of building buildings back in those days where they built palaces or temples because there was a lack of stone to, to build stuff with. So I'll talk about Leonard Woolley later. He, he's one of the guys that found Ur and they began excavating and trying to rebuild it, which parts of Ur have been rebuilt uh, at one point. Now, let me get into also some other stuff about the Sumerians. Uh, yeah, they're known for technologies, of course. Uh, and uh, you saw in the video how the big invention that the Sumerians, of course, invented was cuneiform. Yeah, cuneiform is their big thing that they're known for. Cuneiform is, you know, considered to be uh, the first writing system developed in the world. It was a type of Sumerian writing system or language system that uh, was developed by uh, or used by other people. Uh, I think it's used all the way down to the time of King Nebuchadnezzar. They're using it. So it may have been used for something like almost 3,000 years uh, as an actual language. And uh, cuneiform is not like other languages. Uh, it's kind of like this, um, it's kind of a, a complicated language system which uses uh, wet clay tablets. I've got a uh, picture here to show you, but they would write with a stylus on these uh, wet clay tablets and it would make indentions into it. And so the term uh, that came out over time was the term wedge shaped, was the term they used to, 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 to come up with the term cuneiform. It means wedge shaped. And because um, the stylus would make this triangular or wedge shaped symbol to it. And cuneiform is a type of language system which uses a combination of like um, logograms or pictograms, I guess would be the best way to put it. But over time, it's they started to use like alphabetic type syllables that, you know, made up words um, that might be based on like objects or ideas or whatever. 
And over time, I think the average symbols it developed was like maybe 800, uh, the most that they used. So it was a very complicated system. Uh, and apparently the Sumerians and others were very, you know, very literate. A lot of people could, could use the language. Uh, and uh, they found thousands of these tablets throughout Mesopotamia, uh, as many as maybe half a, half a million to, I don't know, maybe up to two million have been found um, overall, but very few have been translated. I think I want, I've read somewhere that maybe 100,000 tablets have been translated or published. There's very few cuneiformists that can actually read it. I want to say there's only maybe a few hundred in the world. Uh, so it's one of those fields that's kind of rare uh, as a whole. Uh, over time, the language declined because of Phoenician. You know about Phoenician, which is a more simplified alphabet. And other languages came in that were better. And, and so people forgot how to write in it or read it. And uh, they weren't really able to really read it again until modern times. So people have kind of figured the language out uh, overall, kind of like hieroglyph, uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs as well. So that's like cuneiform. That's probably their most famous thing that you know they were you know known for inventing um, overall. Uh, they were known for epic poems. Uh, of course, the most famous is the Epic of Gilgamesh. Everybody's probably heard of that. Uh, considered one of the oldest recorded stories in history. Uh, Gilgamesh was probably written, ooh, it was written over 4,000 years ago, uh, they believe. And as you know, it tells the story of this ancient king of um, Iraq I told you about, what you see here, uh, E-R-U-K, Iraq, uh, which is Gilgamesh, sometimes also spelled Bilgamesh with a B as well. And uh, he may have been a legend. You know, it's kind of a debate about whether he was a real king or not as a whole. And the story of Gilgamesh was written first down by the Sumerians, uh, and then other peoples wrote variations of it too. Babylonians, Akkadians, Assyrians, I think all have their different versions of it uh, that followed. I think the Akkadian one might be the most famous one later, uh, but it's a 12-tablet uh, story. Uh, which tells about the adventures of Gilgamesh. And uh, it does parallel the story of the biblical flood, like the story of Noah that appears in Genesis. It does have, you know, par parallels to it uh, overall. And um, I've got that out there. But um, yeah, there's very similar stories to it. Uh, there's actually a, a case where Gilgamesh meets this uh, Sumerian Noah in the story uh, where he's building an ark because uh, there's a great flood coming. And so um, I think at the time, if you read about the story about Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh was in the, was in search of um, the secret to, to uh, immortality. And this this uh, guy, his name was, um, I if I write the name down, but his name was up Napishtim, I think is his name. Uh, he was some kind of Mesopotamian sage of some type mentioned in the story of Gilgamesh. And he tells him about this great flood, but also about this plant that he could eat. And if he ate it, uh, he would become immortal. Uh, and of course, Gilgamesh searched for that. I think he found the plant, but a serpent stole it from him. And he realized that he wasn't going to be immortal. And only the gods can be immortal. So... So Gilgamesh is a famous story. Uh, it's later found, there's a complete copy of it that's actually found in one, a famous library in Nineveh. So that's why they know pretty much about the whole story as a whole. So yeah, it's the most famous story told early on uh, by the Sumerians. And, uh, but most of the Sumerians, you know, use cuneiform for record keeping. <laughs> and then over time it, kind of evolved into to like a language, you know. Uh, what are some other things that the Sumerians were kind of known for invention? Why? Oh, yeah, they invented religion. Uh, they were the first to have organized religion. I'll get to it later, but they had like these massive temples that they would build um, to the gods, uh, which were called ziggurats later. 
And it's believed that a lot of the city states were kind of like a theocracy ruled by like a very strong priesthood as a whole. So they, they were the first to have organized religion in most city states had a chief God, but they do think the Sumerians had probably hundreds of gods uh, in nature uh, in general. Uh, other things I don't have on the screen there, uh, which were technologies that they invented. <laughs> There's a lot of things uh, that the Sumerians uh, invented. Um, people think the wheel, the wheel was invented uh, by them. The chariot, the war chariot uh, was invented by the Sumerians. The sailboat, uh, they were first to have irrigation, um, like the early plow, probably a bronze type plow used for farming. It was probably used. Uh, glass, bronze casting, they were the first to like, you know, smelt bronze from copper and tin. Uh, you saw in the video, they had some types of calendar system, uh, astronomy. Uh, they knew about time, like they knew about the minute, 60 seconds in a minute. They knew about the hour. You saw they divided the calendar into 12 months, seven days of the week. So they knew all this stuff. They had a form of mathematics that they had. Um, although it's kind of weird, they didn't know about, they they couldn't understand zero. They didn't they understand, they, they couldn't understand that, zero. Um, what was those? Oh, of course, there's one that's everybody talks about, you know, a lot with Sumerians, a uh, beer. You know, they think Sumerians invented beer, alcohol. Um, so that's probably their other big invention that's still around today. You know, that's real popular, huh? Beer. <laughs> anyway, so this, uh, they invented a lot of things, uh, the Sumerian culture as a whole. And then what happened was other people came in and just, you know, started copying them and, and all that. Now, I need to talk about the big thing that the Sumerians, they, they, of course, architecture-wise, they were known for the famous ziggurat, uh, the temple towers or these mud brick step pyramids that were built throughout Mesopotamia, not just by them, but by other cultures uh, as well. Uh, of course, there's examples, you know, the most famous, you know, ziggurat, I guess is what it was, uh, that's in the Bible is the Tower of Babel. Uh, which is mentioned in Genesis 11. Uh, and, uh, you know, God talks about this story about how uh, the people at the time, I guess it was after the great flood, um, were building this huge tower to heaven. Uh, and God got angry about it, um, didn't want them to do that. And so he made all the workers speak different languages so they couldn't finish it. And so the term, the word Babel supposedly meant confusion in Hebrew or something like that. It's where the word Babel or Babylon comes from. Babylon, I believe to be originated from that later, just maybe where it was built. And I think there may have been more than one version of it. And I know one story in the Bible, they say Nimrod built it. He was like, I think, Noah's great grandson. And then some people think there was another version of it later that was built later that was called Intemenanki which I'll mention too, um, which may have been there. Because I think they, they, they say the ruins of it is still there, like the base of it is still there at ancient Babylon, the site. And um, so that may have been, you know, I think they seem to think Intamanaki may have been like 300 feet tall, although they think the Tower of Babel may have been like, some people claim it was 8,000 feet tall <laughs> in some biblical sources, <laughs> which is insane, you know. Uh, I doubt that's possible. So anyway, um, but that, that Tower of Babel, you know, whether that was real or not, they're not sure. But there may have been like this Antimononki type ziggurat that may have been built by, some people think it was built by King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, who was a later Babylonian ruler. Uh now, most uh, Mesopotamian ziggurats kind of have a square shape to it. Like the ones that are Sumerian anyway, mostly look like that shape. Uh, there's one that's very famous uh, that's called the Great Ziggurat of Ur, or also called the Ziggurat of Ur, which they think was built in the 21st century BC. That's the one that's around now uh, that's like real famous. Uh, and um, they think it was built by a king 
by the name of um, of Ur Namu. I'll put his name on here. It's like we've got some other students here also saying hi. Yeah, Jason, I'll get to the Sumerian religion later. I haven't, that's the last thing I'll talk about. And of course, Erica on the screen as well. But um, there's also, uh, yeah, Ur Namu was a, um, I'll put it on here for you, but he was a Sumerian king of origin that lived in the 21st century, I believe. And uh, he was believed to be the one that built the great cigarette of Ur uh, over 4,000 years ago. I think they consider him to be the, the greatest Sumerian king. Uh, that's first mentioned. And he even had a uh, law code system. I know everybody talks about Hammur King Hammurabi, right? And the, the Hammurabi code uh, and all of that. Uh, but he had his own code system he had too. It was called the code of, I think, ur or something that was invented over 4,000 years ago. Uh, but he built that ziggurat. Uh, and um, what happened was Sumerian uh, culture uh, collapsed and it was conquered by other people. And it, it went out of use. Like nobody used the building anymore. It kind of, I think it collapsed over time. And then in modern times, it was found in the early 20th century. Uh, there was a guy named... Um, I think I had a picture of him, which was up here. His name was Sir Leonard Woolley. I think it's kind of a picture of him right here. But Sir Leonard Woolley was the man that actually discovered uh, the site of Ur and the, the ziggurat uh, that's there now. Uh, and um, he's from England, British guy. And uh, he was uh, in search of like... Um, I think he had studied about the Bible. He was a, he was one, considered one of the first early archaeologists, but some I think people kind of consider him like a bibble, biblical type archaeologist, trying to discover like archaeological sites that were mentioned in the Bible uh, and so on. So he went there and he found uh, the great ziggurat of Ur, and he, he was the one that first excavated it, and he even found like on the inside of it like tombs that were buried in it. Uh, because the ziggurat wasn't just like a, a temple. It was built uh, as like a civic center, like where the king ruled, uh, and I guess it's government and so on. And they had the temple as well. They worship you know, whatever god they worship there. And, uh, and then they say he found part of the house of Abraham, which they think there was some kind of house that was there at Ur, where Abraham lived there in the Bible. I think the Arabs in Mesopotamia claim it's, probably, you know, real maybe. They think he may have found part of it, like the corner of Abraham's house, uh, which that has actually been rebuilt. Like here's a picture of um, like what it looks like now, the great Zerg of Ur, but the house of Abraham has been mostly been rebuilt um, where ancient Ur is. But the Zerg itself, uh, a lot of the outside of it was later, uh, kind of just case with different like brick later by um, Saddam Hussein, who was in power in Iraq in the 1980s. He's what pretty much put a lot of the facade on the outside. So that's kind of what they think it looked like, but they're not sure. It's kind of like been rebuilt, basically, what you're looking at. So there's no real cigarettes that are still around. Um, except ones that are ruins that they've kind of tried to reconstruct um, as a whole. Uh, there's also the one that everybody's heard about, which is the Hanging Gardens in Babylon. That was, of course, another ziggurat, they believe, that was built in the 6th century B.C. at Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar, who was a later Babylonian ruler. And uh, they believe he built this ziggurat uh, for like one of his wives, like a queen... Uh, and uh, it was, as you know, Hanging Gardens of Babylon uh, was considered to be one of the uh, original seven wonders of the world, like what the ancient Greeks talked about in ancient times. It's a seven wonder. And it's believed to, I think they seem to think it may have been 90 feet tall, maybe taller. It's been a debate about how tall it was. Uh, they think maybe the base of it is still there at 
what is left of Babylon. And they do think up to the time of Alexander the Great, it was still around. Uh, hand guards of Babylon. I think even Alexander tried to have it rebuilt as well, uh, but it collapsed later. So, so that's basically it. And you can see that a lot of these um, ziggurats, they would put trees and greenery on it. And a lot of the ziggurats were made to look like mountains. Uh, they believe that the word ziggurat is an Akkadian word that means mountain of God. So it's like where they, the gods resided, I guess. And uh, I think there's some, even some theories is maybe that's where the Sumerians came from, from a mountainous region somewhere in Asia, which they don't know. Uh, and um, but a lot of them were made to look like mountains like there. And I think that one, they say, even had mechanical waterfalls. They brought water to the top uh, and rain down, which is amazing, you know, for the time. So anyway, just kind of talking about the different ziggurats that were, you know, well known. Yeah, the Sumerians had like a religion of some type, which uh, they believe that involved some kind of priesthood, uh, which was involved in the temples. They do think they built statues to their gods. Like there's a famous story of the Bible, I think, that's mentioned how they built this huge statue to the god Martuk, which may have been a 20 foot gold statue that weighed like 20 tons or something like that. Crazy. And, um, but a lot of these were ancient gods, like the one that's the, um, I guess, most famous one they talk about is usually the god An, which was later called Anu, A-N-U, by the, the uh, I think Akkadians called him that later, Anu. And that was considered to be uh, the highest god in the Sumerian pantheon. Uh, it was considered like the king of the gods who resided in the heavens. It was kind of considered like a sky god or god of the heavens. And Anu has often been connected with like the Greek Roman god of Zeus or Jupiter. That's what they think. Um, although Marduk, Martuk is sometimes considered kind of similar to like Jupiter, because I think they considered it to be connected with the planet Jupiter. Uh, so, but but uh, at that time, Anu was like, you know, um, the chief god and other gods replaced him, you know, over time uh, is what happened. Uh, then you can see there uh, in the slide uh, that uh, he had two sons, uh, one named Enki and another named Enlil. So they became popular. I think Enki later kind of replaced Anu as a chief god. And you can see they kind of divided up things like Enki uh, became mostly this earth god uh, that was mostly the god of like the water, like seas, oceans, or whatever. And he was also a god of like wisdom or knowledge. Um, so he was important um, as a god. And then also another god was Enlil, uh, who was like a wind god usually associated like storms, air, and stuff like that. And so it's like Anu's like the sky, Enki's like the water, Enlil's like the air or wind. So it's kind of weird how that is. Um, they divided up these gods. It's kind of similar to like the Greek Roman gods. You know, you got like Zeus, Poseidon, Hades kind of divide up the world. That's kind of what happens. Uh, that idea. So, uh, but over time, what happened, there was another God, by the time you get down like Assyrian Babylonian times under King Nebuchadnezzar, there was another God named Martuk that became popular, which became like a Babylonian God, God of water magic. And he became like the big chief God that everybody worshiped the most out of all the gods. And that was around until like the Persians came in. But a lot of these guys were kind of probably still around later. It was like the Greeks and Romans came in and I guess they were still being practiced uh, more or less. Uh, but over time, they declined for other gods that, you know, come into the Mesopotamian world and so on. Uh, Martuk was believed to be like a son of um, Enki uh, as well. But there's all kinds. Of, they, they've got a pantheon of gods. they got, of course, they've goddesses and things like that. I'm not going to go through all these different gods or whatever, but there's like plenty of them. 
uh, that they had um, overall. Now, what happened to the Sumerians as a whole, culture-wise? Well, they were conquered by other people that came in. Uh, one of the main groups that enter, of course, the region is the Akkadians. I can probably talk a little bit, a few minutes on them. The Akkadian and the so-called Akkadian Empire uh, that emerges next. Uh, the Akkadians were a people that originated, you can see, there's a city here called Akkad, A-K-K-A-D, Akkad, right here. And um, they were a Semitic people of origin, the Akkadians. It's, pronounced, it's spelled different ways. That's usually how they spell it that way. And uh, it's believed that the Akkadians over time, when were the Akkadians around? I'll put it on the screen here. They think they were probably around... I guess the um, peak period would be 24th to about the 22nd centuries. That would be, uh, of course, B.C. Uh, would be about when it was. So roughly 2300s to maybe the 2100s. They were around at one point. And you can see their chief god was this king named Sargon. He's called all kinds of names. Um, Sargon of Akkad. Sargon the Great, Sargon the First. I don't know if there's really an official name of him. Uh, but he was the ruler, and he was the one that conquered pretty much most of that region. The areas he conquered were mostly multiple areas. Uh, he conquered like what would be um, like Sumer, uh, Elam, um, Akkad, uh, also the area in the north, which was later called Assyria, all those are the areas that um, he mostly controlled, um, which I'll kind of show you um, here on the map uh, where all these areas are. Elam is like kind of like right here. That's uh, Sumer in the yellow. Uh, Cod is in here. And then Assyria is kind of up here. So all that's kind of, although Assyria doesn't exist yet, but it will be, of course, later. But that's all the areas that are included. They do think his empire stretched all the way to Turkey and what they think was the basically the Mediterranean Sea. And um, the Cadian Empire was considered to be one of the first like empires in the world. It may have also been the first multi-ethnic empire. Actually, that's the first statue of, um, of any kind of ruler of Mesopotamia uh, that you're looking at. That's actually a part of a statue of Sargon that survived. It's like the got a hole in one of his eyes. And uh, so, but they were very short lived, the Akkadian Empire. They weren't around very long. But uh, what happened was they took over Sumer, the Sumerians, and they combined their culture together. And so a lot of the culture afterwards uh, in Mesopotamia is often called, uh, the term they will often use uh, is uh, Akkadian Sumerian. That's the culture that they usually dub it later, Akkadian Sumerian. And uh, yeah, the Akkadians adopted pretty much a lot of the culture of the Sumerians, like from language to technologies and so on. And they kind of like became like one people afterwards. So that's pretty much what happened. Uh, and uh, they weren't around like to like maybe the 22nd century and then their empire collapsed. And what happened was, you see where it says Sagros Mountains, which is kind of to the east, up in that area, you had people like the, I think the Gutians and a few other groups came in and sacked Akkad and the state collapsed. And that was pretty much it uh, for the Akkadians. Now, what happened after that, though, uh, was that, um, excuse me about that. It's like it went out. But um, what happened after that was that um, Mesopotamia then split into like two spheres. And um, like the northern part became, uh, there's different terms they use for it. Like the upper part of Mesopotamia is often called up, Upper Mesopotamia. And they often call that, um, I think the term they'll use, like I told you earlier before, a lot of people will call it uh, Assyria. 
So the upper part became Assyria. Uh, and then the lower part of Mesopotamia became uh, known as um, Babylonia. I'll put that on there. Yeah, Babylonia and um, like the upper one first, of course, mostly is going to include areas which will be like um, like uh, northern Iraq, Syria, uh, southeastern Turkey, and then the other one, which is the lower part of Mesopotamia, will include southern Iraq, Kuwait area predominantly uh, is where that area is. You'll see different civilizations come out of there. Uh, you'll have, of course, uh, the one we'll talk about first later, not today, probably, I guess, if we have time for that. But the first one we'll talk about is the lower Mesopotamia, which will be the Babylonian Empire. That's the one of King Hammurabi that first emerges, um, like sometime close to about the 19th, 18th century BC. Uh, so you got that one. And then um, the upper one's going to have Mesopotamia, it's going to have the Assyrian Empire, which will emerge at the end of the Bronze Age. Uh, early Iron Age, and uh, those are two kind of like rival states that eventually take over Iraq, but at different times uh, that are basically there. So that's the bulk of the information, uh, probably lecture-wise, I've got today. Um, well, somebody's got, like, Kiara's got a question about, are the Sumerians and Mesopotamians are the same people? So Mesopotamia is just a term they use broad for like everybody. The Sumerians are just a culture that were in Mesopotamia, which is a bunch of civilizations uh, that were there. So we've only talked about really just two so far, Sumerian and Akkadian, which all were you know, living in uh, Mesopotamia. And I told you the Akkadian Sumerians combined as one culture. Um, let me also, I don't know if I have time to go what else I've got into. I'm not going to have time probably to do, um, I'll get later into talking. We didn't get to do the Babylonians, so we'll talk about that later. Where is the one I wanted to show you? Sorry about that. Pass that up. Go back up here. Went to the bottom there by accident. We'll talk about the Babylonians later, about that culture it's called Paleo Babylonian Empire, or also called the. Um, it's called different names, but Paleo First Babylonian Empire, and then of course Old Babylonian Empire, and that's the one, of course, of Hammurabi. So I kind of have time to cover that today, but I will go ahead and review some of the uh, questions in the study guide that we've got so far. And I'll continue later on Wednesday covering more on Mesopotamia. So, um, yeah, I did have some questions in here um, about Mesopotamia. It's like these are kind of, oh, there there are. Some of these are out of order for some reason. Looks like I'm missing a slide here for some reason. I notice that's not in the study guide. I notice oh, that's weird about the Sumerians. I notice they're not in there about that. But there's the some ones I missed that are not in there for some reason. Uh, like what is Mesopotamia? Uh, Mesopotamia, of course, uh, was the first civilization, uh, of course, uh, in the world, which was based in Iraq as a whole. And I um, wish I could add that slide in there for you for some reason. I don't know where it went to. I must have deleted it by accident in the original slide. That's strange. But anyway, but Mesopotamia itself uh, included um, the land between the rivers, which is mostly where Iraq is today. And I told you, like, the Fertile Crescent uh, is, of course, the original um, nickname that they call the area of where Mesopotamia is, but also includes as well, like, Euphrates Valley, Tigris River Valley, uh, also the... Um, Jordan River Valley, and then some people do include, of course, the Nile River Valley as well. So we have that. Um, I talked about that. Uh, I talked about the cradle civilization. That was another term we had discussed earlier about how Iraq or Mesopotamia is where the first civilization started a long time ago. 
Um, and then we talked about the biblical stories, right? Garden of Eden uh, was a topic that's there in, in, of course, the Bible. The story of Noah and the ark. Um, you got the um, story of the Tower of Babel. And then also Abraham, which I showed you the house of Abraham, was also another story which sometimes appears in the Bible as well. Uh, then we talked about Mesopotamia as a culture uh, that developed in Mesopotamia in Iraq. Uh, as one of the first civilizations. I told you how Mesopotamia is divided into two different groups, the uh, Semitic peoples, and you've got the um, Indo-Aryan or Indo-European peoples. So Semitic peoples would be like Akkadians, Babylonians, Assyrians, uh, Israelites or Jews, Arabs. Uh, those are the bulk of them uh, that are usually considered. Along. Also, you can consider the Phoenicians as well. And we talked about the um, Indo-Aryan or Europeans, like the Hittites in Turkey. I think we mentioned about the Persians in Iran as different peoples that came out of like Asia and Europe overall. So-called Caucasian peoples, they call them later. Uh, I do have this part of the slide you're looking at there, though, which you see right here. But you've got, you know, you can see like Sumerians, of course, were the first civilization there. Uh, that was in Iraq, also called Sumer. Uh, and uh, the Sumerians, you know, were the first to develop like cuneiform. That's like their greatest technology that they were known for. Sumer was located in southern Iraq, um, which would be like on the bottom of Mesopotamia. And um, the, kind, the kind of technology that they had besides cuneiform, first writing system they had, I told you how they had like um, the development of the ziggurat, uh, which was the type of tower temples or um, step pyramids or mud brick step pyramids that were well known, not just like mentioned in the Bible, like the Tower of Babel, but also mentioned by um, other ancient sources. I think the Greeks talk about the, the hanging gardens of Babylon as an example I told you about the great ziggurat of Ur, uh, the one that they've excavated and kind of rebuilt in southern Iraq as a whole. I uh, told you they invented all kinds of things, Sumerians, from glass, bronze. Uh, I told you they invented the, probably the wheel, chariot, sailboat, irrigation, the plow, that architecture you saw in the video, calendar system, astronomy. They knew about the minute. They knew about the hour. They, had, they pretty much had a seven-day calendar, um, 12 months in the year. Uh, they knew about um, pretty much most stuff that's later, uh, technological-wise. Um, beer was something that they think they invented, which is like the first type of alcohol that was also popular later. Uh, archaeologists, of course, I discovered Great Ziggurat of Ur. Of course, I told you that was Sir Leonard Woolley. Uh, he was the one that invented it. And um, uh, well, he, he excavated it, I know, like around 1920s, I think it is. And he's one that kind of went, I told you, excavated the inside of it and found tombs and all that. And then um, Later under Saddam Hussein, who was later president of Iraq, he was the one that basically uh, began um, like the rebuilding of the outside of it, adding the facade that's there now. And so they're not sure if that's really how it was rebuilt and all that. Main gods, of course, Sumerians, I told you the chief ones were Anu, Enki, and Enlil. Anu was more like a, a sky god, kind of like a Zeus type god. Enki was more like an earth god associated with water, wisdom. Enlil was a god associated with like the air, storms, uh, etc. And the Babylonians had, of course, Martuk, which became the ch big chief god by the time of the Assyrians and um, Babylonians, like under Nebuchadnezzar. And they were more like considered uh, the chief god. That's sometimes considered almost like a type of Jupiter or Zeus god too later as well. Um, but Marduk was worshipped mostly at Babylon. Uh, Akkadians, we told you just briefly about that. Uh, Akkadians, of course, were a Semitic people 
I told you that conquered Mesopotamia, formed the Akkadian Empire, which was kind of made up of different civilizations like the Sumerians, Akkadians, and other peoples that were in Iraq or Mesopotamia. And the founder, of course, was the king um, Sargon, who's called all kinds of names, usually Sargon of Akkad, Sargon the Great, or Sargon the First. Sargon's really the first great king uh, in Mesopotamia, and maybe the first king to be rule, ruling over some type of multinational empire uh, at the time. They're later crushed by other peoples and Later, I am going to be getting to the Babylonians. I'm not to, I guess we won't have time today to do it, but I will be, you know, later talking about the old Babylonian Empire, which kind of peaked around the 18th, 17th centuries. It's about when it is in Iraq. That's an empire which is famous for developing like the Code of Hammurabi, which is considered one of the first major legal code system in the world, which is copied by a lot of people, and I think the Bible even copies it and a lot of its laws. We'll talk about King Hammurabi later. Their empire is kind of short-lived, uh, and their empire eventually will uh, break up, and it'll be replaced by other empires like the Assyrians that will emerge at the end of the Bronze Age and going into the so-called Iron Age later. So, that's it pretty much for lecture um, on like the early part of, you know, Mesopotamia today. I didn't quite get to, like, I, didn't, I wanted to do Babylonians today. Um, yeah, I'm going to get to that later. I, I just didn't have time to do the Code of Hammurabi. I'll do that next. We'll talk about that. I guess the first thing we'll talk about next class will be about uh, the Code. I haven't done that yet because that's going to be the next thing coming up. Uh, so I was kind of short on that today. But uh, if there's any questions about my lecture, let me know. Uh, I think I messed up on one of the slides there with the review. I don't know what happened exactly. So I think I may have deleted it by accident, but I'll go back and add it in there for you. On the second lecture on 1 o'clock, I'll share that fixed for some reason. So it's kind of a hit and miss on that. But um, that's it for today. But I want to remind you, though, that uh, we do have, of course, a Canvas quiz, uh, which is in quizzes due next Monday, um, which I believe is September the 7th, I think it is. So get that done for now. Uh, I had, had some earlier announcements I had early go back and listen to as well, but I was talking about the, I think the book report and I think that veterans uh, project, if anybody's interested in that, let me know as well. So that's it for today, but I will have a one o'clock stream as well. Hopefully that will be a little better, that one. It's kind of messed up on a few things, but that's it for today. Uh, Y'all take care, and I'll see you later, either today or on Wednesday. Okay? So take care. This is the end of the broadcast.